Hey everybody, this is Alex Merced from alexmercedcoder.com and this is going to be an episode of the Web Dev 101 Podcast and Data Nation because the topics I'm going to be talking about in this episode heavily relate to both. Um, so, and that's that's the deal there. Now I'm going to be referring to something called Apache Arrow and Apache Arrow Flight quite a bit in this podcast. I did write up an article um, for my work with the Dremio that I'm going to link to in the, the uh, podcast description. So do read that article. Uh, I give a deeper explanation to like what Arrow is and why it matters. I'll give you a, a preliminary discussion of that here. But the focus of this episode is going to be RPC remote procedure call because I've worked with APIs quite a bit, and you know whether they're making RESTful APIs, or making GraphQL APIs. I've done a lot of that. No SOAP APIs. I don't think anyone does SOAP APIs anymore. But um, one of these days, I need to go uh, dig into the historical archives to kind of have a better understanding of what SOAP is. But let's just first like set the stage of what do we mean by like APIs. Okay. Bottom line is everything is a protocol. Protocol is a set of sort of set of standards that allow two people to communicate. So the example I like to use is like the post office. So the think of the post office, the whole mail system has a protocol. I know that if I want to send a letter, what I got to do is just take whatever I want to send, put it in an envelope, with the proper postage, drop it off at the post office. Now, how does the post office get it from point A to point B? I don't know, nor do I care. Those are referred to as the implementation details. Okay, the actual like how does it happen? Technically, if you have a good abstraction, you don't care about implementation details. I know how to send a letter, even if I don't know how the letter actually gets sent. And the person knows how to receive a letter. Neither of us have to really worry about all those other details. Okay? And protocols allow that to happen because we all I have to do is follow a standard process and I don't have to worry about the other pieces because there's not well, there's not infinite possibilities of what could happen that I need to be understand and be prepared for. There's a way of doing things, and long as I follow that way of doing things, things work. So in the world of computers, there are lots and lots of protocols. Okay, um, for example, transmission uh, was a transmission control pr protocol, uh, and that's TCP. So you always hear like TCP, IP, and all this stuff. Now, what TCP is, is essentially the protocol that, that, that basically says when there's two computers on a network, whether it's a intranet you know, or your home network or the broader internet, how do those two computers send the message to each other? So this is like the whole idea of like, okay, hey, I'm going to identify this IP address. This computer is going to go communicate with that computer. They're going to shake hands, say, hey, this is where it's okay for us to talk to each other and then deliver some text, okay? Um, but that's pretty, pretty low level. Like, yes, now all computers can talk to each other, whether they're Windows, Mac, um, you know, Linux. It doesn't matter the operating system because they're all working from the same uh, uh, TCP playbook as far as how do they communicate over a network. But at the end of the day, like, what can a, a message in text look like? It can look like infinite different ways. So... Yeah, I could receive a message of text, but the thing is that usually you don't want text messages. I want to look at a website. I want to download software. So those that message coming in uh, has to be somehow interpretable. There has to be some sort of format. So we get into higher level protocols that say, okay, hey, we already have the way to, to send each other messages, but how do we format that letter? And this is like different protocols like HTTP, WebSockets, whatnot. They're all basically explaining like, Okay, this is how the messages sent over TCP should look like, and then you know other standards like far as like software that decides to use this this type of message, how should they interpret how they should treat those messages and creating these kind of standards. So different browsers, websites look the same way. You type in a URL, you know the experience is very much the same because there's a protocol, there's a standard, there's the the HTTP protocol, the how the messages are written back and forth, and then there's you know the software and how the software interprets those those messages and all that's standardized via the protocol okay and lots of other standards cool so we have standards in how computers talk to each other we have standards in how those messages that computers send to each other look like now what happens is that using that using http using tcp we oftentimes create apis this is a way for different applications to talk to each other now if you're a web developer like i've been most of my career um, 
you know, usually to you, when you think API, you're thinking, okay, this is going to be how my front end talks to my back end, or how do I talk to somebody else's application to pull stuff into my front end or my back end? Okay. But at the end of the day, it really just means how can two applications talk to each other? Okay. What is, what is going to be sort of the standard set of rules that one application can send a message to another one and the other one knows what to do with the message? Okay. So you're creating some sort of, you know, a, a standard. And there's standards in how you create those APIs. But at the end of the day, the whole point of the API is just to say, hey, this language can talk to that language, can talk, this application can talk to this application um, because of this. Okay. Pretty cool. So there's a traditional like REST API. And the way that a REST API works is that generally you would, you know, there'd be a server, okay, a server application of some sort that basically can receive HTTP messages and then based on the URL and the HTTP method of the request being sent to the server, it can then, it then has like a laundry list of different like functions that it runs. So it's like, oh, okay, here, you sent me a get request to slash people. Okay, let me go find the function that matches that pairing. Okay, so if you've used like Express or really you've done a web server in any language, Rails, Django and Python, Rails and Ruby, whatever, Laravel and PHP. If you've done a web server, you've probably written routes. And routes, you're saying like, okay, hey, if it's a get request to this URL, do this. If it's a get request, if it's a post request to this URL, do that. And that's basically what a RESTful API looks like. Several different URLs, and the different URLs do the thing that they're told based on the function that they're given. That works, okay? And that's generally how a lot, if not most, of the internet is built through through REST APIs. Okay, and I, most people really generally, if you're a developer, probably know how to work with the REST API. It's generally one of the, those foundational building blocks because nowadays you no longer build just one giant application. You build a lot of little mini microservices, and each of those microservices have to have an API with which they can communicate to other services. The benefit of this is those services can actually be used for multiple applications or, um, you know, you basically everything is much more deconstructed in the way we architect things. And the reason being is you get more reusability instead of creating these monolithic sort of setups. Okay, and this goes for web applications, uh, data pipelines, everything's becoming more and more deconstructed. Okay, because if I can use that same authentication logic for multiple applications by creating one authentication service that has an API that multiple applications can talk to, think of something like an Auth0 or whatnot, um, then that thing takes care of that. And then all I have to do worry about is making the things that are unique to my application instead of rebuilding the same things over and over again. Okay. But downsides are like with the REST API, generally I make a request. I don't really have any control over what data I get back most of the time. So I'm going to get back a whole bunch of data, oftentimes a lot of more data than I need because different people have different use cases of the data. And on top of that, generally the documentation really falls on the developers of the API to create. Like nowadays there's tools like Swagger that make it much easier to, to um, you know, get the documentation for an API, but still at the end of the day, like REST APIs can, be, can vary quite a bit from, from application to application. Um, thus documentation is quite necessary, like how they authenticate, all these different details that can be very different. So then Facebook creates like GraphQL, and GraphQL is another one of these sort of like API protocols. And basically what happens in there is instead of having like a whole bunch of different URLs that you make different requests to, you have one URL that you make a request to, and the request is always a post request. What determines what happens is what you deliver with the post request. So you deliver generally a string in the body of the post request uh, so still, you're still using HTTP requests, okay? Um, you, you, you deliver um, the post request, and then the string, okay, a string is delivered that defines sort of like what query, if you're trying to get data, what mutation, if you're trying to create, update, or delete data is being sent, and what information you want to get back. The great thing about this is with the GraphQL APIs, I can control what information I get back. So if I don't need all the information the API would provide, I can specify what I do want in the query. I'm not having to deal with multiple URLs, um, but I do have to learn like a query language, the GraphQL, you know, Graph query language. Um, and then making a GraphQL server is a little, can sometimes be a little bit more involved because not only do you have to define the functions for each query and each mutation, 
but then you have to define all these data types. And oftentimes you're already defining data types with your database. Like you always generally with like your ORM or something like that, you're already doing a bunch of schema definitions. So it can be sort of redundant to be doing. There are tools nowadays that kind of help reduce that redundancy. There's platforms like Asura that kind of make uh, spinning that up a lot easier where you don't have to really do most of the work in creating a GraphQL API. But at the end of the day, like, you know, just with just creating a raw plain vanilla GraphQL API, um, it can be a little tedious. Although I think it's fun. And the other benefit is that it's self-documenting. So the GraphQL API, basically because you type everything and you define the types when you create the server, it it uh, automatically generates documentation. So someone who connects your API doesn't have to have a hard time figuring out like what does your API do. Like you don't the documentation is created automatically. So that's pretty cool. Okay, and now what's kind of not necessarily a new thing, but something that's kind of gaining more traction is something called RPC, Remote Procedure Call. And RPC is more like a grander sort of like more conceptual thing of the idea that instead of making a request to a particular endpoint or sending a particular query, what you're really doing is you're making a function call. The only thing is that, and you know, another word for function is procedure or subroutine. These are all words that you'll see across different languages for function. So the difference here is that you're not calling a function that's defined in your application, but a, a function that's implemented somewhere else in some other application. So you don't necessarily know or have access to the implementation of this function you're calling because it's somewhere else. Okay, Java had a thing built into it that's kind of like this, and that was kind of the thing that caused that whole log for J snafu, but um, it's different, but similar in concept. The idea that you can, you can, uh, well, actually, the difference there with Java, what it was, is that you could actually introduce foreign objects into uh, Java using this feature that I think is deprecated in, in newer versions of Java. Um, yeah, that's what's referred to as a log4j. It was a big thing if you've been following development. Re in recent times, you've probably heard about this whole log4j error. Um, it's a really interesting topic. Um, but back to RPC. So what RPC is, you're saying, it's like, I'm going to run this function, but how does this function work depends on the server in which I'm making the request to. Okay, and what makes this interesting is that what you do is that the de definition of the actual service, like all these functions, and what do they need to receive, what will they give back, is defined separate of the server and the client. Okay, so again, when I'm doing GraphQL, I'm, I have to define those dev types in my client code, kind of. <clears throat> Here in RPC world, Specifically, if you're using the framework gRPC, which is a RPC framework created by Google, um, what you do is you start off by creating what's called a protobuf file. And a, proto, a protobuf is a protocol for defining these types to be sent over uh, the wire, meaning you know over the interwebs. And I create this proto file, and this proto file defines like these are the different types of data, these are the different types of services, these services have these functions. Um, I basically type it all out. Um, the cool thing is that this proto file can then be used and implemented as many times as I want. So you start off with this proto file that defines sort of like, this is like the contract saying, okay, if you're a server, these are the services that this proto file that defines and you need to implement them. I mean, you need to define how these things work, but this is, this is like their signatures. So I have a function that takes a nothing and gives back a dog. You need to implement that. Okay. And then to the client, the proto file is like a contract saying, hey, any server that implements this proto file, you can use this proto file as a way to make calls to that server and be able to interact with that service regardless of how they implemented it. Like you don't have to care about how they make it work. You just know that, hey, these functions take in this information and will give me back this information. And that's a, that's a promise and that's all you really need to know. Okay. <clears throat> and this can be pretty interesting. The actual creating of a gRPC API, even with gRPC, is a little tedious. Probably, probably I would say it's like the most complicated upfront of the three options, AP, RESTful, GraphQL, gRPC. Um, the benefit is, and again, I think a really good application to see like what the benefit is, is this thing called Apache Arrow. So let's talk about the Apache Arrow ecosystem for a moment to kind of help put this in the, the perspective. Okay. 
So what happens is that traditionally, like you would connect to uh, databases using like um, ODBC, JDBC, like standard like connectors. Okay. Um, J ODB stands for like Open Database Connectivity. JDBC stands for like Java Database Connectivity. Um, but there'd be these drivers. There's like these standard like sort of approaches to to how you transport the data from like the client to the server and from the server back. And that all is fine and good, but they were created like back in like 1997. Okay, so this is a while ago. Okay, I mean, you know, in my mind, it doesn't seem like 1997 was not that long ago, but you know, that is over 20 years, like, let's see here, is that 20 years ago? Yeah, it is over 20 years ago, so um, time has flown by. I have gotten old. Wow. Okay. But these were sort of old standards, and then basically they deliver data in a certain way and whatnot. Okay. And generally what's gonna ha what happens then is that like lang uh, for every language, a driver, a, most databases implement these standards, and then what happens as far as how to communicate with the database, and then each uh, language then implements a driver to how to communicate with different databases. Um, which can be tedious because you have to create like a separate, even though they're implementing the same standard, you still need to kind of create a separate driver for Postgres, a separate driver for MySQL, a separate driver for all these different databases. Now, what's nice about Aeroflight, which is more geared towards the data analytics side, this is why this is going to also be on the Data Nation podcast, is what Arrow does, the actual, like Apache Arrow singular, is a data format. Is a, is a format for holding data in memory. So that means not like how we write the file to disk, like, you know, like the Parquet file format. This is how you how the data is kind of organized when the computer, the data is being held in the computer's memory. Because the idea is when it comes to data analytics, you generally prefer to have columnar formats. Because oftentimes when you're doing data, data analytics, you don't need every row of data. You're not saying, hey, give me all the information on every record. You're saying, hey, okay, give me one or two columns you know, give me name and this um, of the data and find me this thing. So in th that case, if it's much easier to just say, hey, I'm going to load up these two columns and then just query the column that's relevant to one, query the data and then give you back the results you need and load up a lot less data into memory. So bottom line, this has been this move to sort of more columnar formats. And Apache Arrow creates a columnar in-memory format in the same way Parquet files are a columnar uh, file format that holds the data, that organizes the data as a column. Okay, and again, this is generally better for data analytics. For transactions, so again, like the application itself, that needs to like add records and delete records, generally you prefer row, uh, traditional sort of row-based data organization. So different, there's no one-size-fits-all way of doing things. But again, this, so Apache Arrow can, Apache Parquet speeds up analytics because you have a file format that is going to be much more queryable because it's in a column. But again, when you load that up into the computer's memory, you want that to still stay columnar, and that's what the role of Apache Arrow is. So that way when you load a column uh, file like an Apache Parquet file, it's sitting in your computer memory in a similar format, so that way you still get those same speed benefits, not just when you load the file, but also when you analyze the data in memory. Now the thing is that you communicate with your database. So when I request data from my database, even if I'm, even if the database holds it in a columnar format, like some databases will hold data in a columnar format, and then I want to receive that data and work with it in a columnar format, so using the arrow flight format or the arrow format to, the problem is the way the data transport, that actual like transporting it from point A to point B. You're still using JDBC, ODBC, which generally is going to be using a row-based format in between point A and point B. Okay, um, point A and point B. So this is, so what you need to do is, do, 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 get, get my bearings, you need to create a way to, you need to create a new standard for transporting data that, that does it in this columnar format. So that way it's columnar from point A, columnar and transport between point A and B, and columnar at point B. Cool. So that's what Aeroflight is. And the way that was implemented was through an RPC API. Okay, so let's think about the benefits of that. So basically there's a proto file, which you can go find on the Apache Aero website, um, that defines the service for how you communicate with 
AeroFlight. Again, AeroFlight is sort of the standard for how you connect, you know, from, and then basically someone can implement a, 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 a server using that protofile um, and create like basically an endpoint on their database software that other applications can connect to. Okay, the great thing is they don't need to create a implementation for every database, they just need to create that protofile and it's up to each database software that wants to take advantage of AeroFlight to implement that protofile. Okay, but the protofile is already made. So basically each database just implements it. And when it comes to the client side, you only have to create one client per language. Because because since the protofile is the same, we don't need to worry about how Postgres implements it versus how, uh, let's say, you know, some other database implements it. Okay, what happens is that, that client will just be following the protofile and know, okay, hey, these are the functions, these are what the functions expect to receive, this is what we're going to get back, and they can communicate. So instead of having to create like a separate driver for each database in each language, you can create one client library that can cover all the databases that follow the arrow flight specification because they're all working for that same protofile. And this is, so this is like a really good use case of using like RPC remote procedure call. Um, and that is cool. <laughs> um, so, and essentially that's technically that the client will be referred to as AeroFlight SQL. So to kind of bring that back together, Apache Arrow is this columnar in memory format. Apache Arrow Flight is like basically the protofile. It's the standard of how, you know, you can communicate. Okay. But then instead of having each person have to implement their own client, because that's, that can be a pain. <laughs> um, what you do is you create a client in each language and those, that's the Apache Arrow Flight SQL piece. Okay, it's the client, so that way the user can just bring up this library in the language and communicate with all the databases that have implemented a server following the Apache Arrow Flight specification. Okay, so that's, that's what Arrow Flight SQL is, that's what Apache Arrow Flight is, and that's what Apache Arrow is. And I just think that's like a really good example of a use case for where RPC really kind of is like a better choice versus like a RESTful API or a um, GraphQL API. Um, so we've covered a lot. Um, I did just release a blog post going with a tutorial on how to create a gRPC API using Node. So that way you can kind of see it in action. And I'll be doing a video of that as well. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, again, make sure to join the Slack communities over there at devnursery.com and datanation.click. So that's devnursery.com for the dev nursery Slack community, which is more web dev oriented, and the data nation, which is more data oriented, is datanation.click. Also, make sure to go register for the Subsurface Conference being held March 2nd and 3rd. Link will be in the podcast description. Okay, whether you're a data person or not, this will be a a uh, conference definitely worth uh, attending. Um, and registration is free, so no harm in registering. And it's going to be held online March 2nd and 3rd. And there's going to be a talk on Apache AeroFlight SQL. So if you found this talk pretty interesting and you're interested in learning more about, you know, this whole Flight SQL thing and what this future of, like, database connectivity is going to look like, I highly recommend going to check out that talk. There's going to be a bunch of other talks on a lot of other interesting topics. Um, so, again, I'll put the link in the description. Check that out. But I'll see you all later on the next time. So this is Alex Merced. You can go to my website, alexmercedcoder.com. And you guys have a wonderful day.